Will the Scottish Greens leave the Butte House Agreement at their special meeting? Will the SNP membership somehow get in there and kind of kick the Greens out first? Uh, this seems to be the talk of the steamy at the moment. We take the slightly uh, more practical view on this, which is who has got the policies needed to get the green transition back on track? as if anyone cared about missing those climate targets. And if there isn't a whole stack of really great ideas sitting on the SNP benches back there, what good is it doing other than scapegoating to pile all the pressure on the Greens? This, I appreciate, will not be the popular view. But nonetheless, we discuss, we look as well um, at the appalling nature of the Rwanda bill probably being passed even as we speak. Those are the headlines. Now for the podcast. Hi, Tom's, and welcome to this week's Leslie Riddick podcast, which today is coming to you on a Monday because of uh, necessary activities that we're both engaged in tomorrow, Tuesday. So, yes, love was in the air on Saturday. It was a beautiful Sunday. And just like Sean Ryder, it's a happy Monday. Hey, because I have eschewed talking about it for the past season, given the travails that happened at the end of last season when... The love of my uh, life at Dundee United were relegated down to the Championship from the Premiership. But this Saturday, uh, uh, Dundee United, uh, th- unless there's a, an Arbroath v Bonacore turnaround where uh, Wraith Rovers managed to collectively win their last two games, 37-0, and Dundee United lose their last two, Dundee United going back up to the Premiership. And- Yes, yes. Oh, God. I mean, it's a funny thing, Leslie, because unless, and I'm not a football supporter, you know, that's a more general thing. I'm someone who supports Dundee United and Scotland, and I go to the matches. I can't abide watching Scotland or Dundee United on on television because I don't feel part of it. And, you know, maybe a delusion that... Uh, maybe not that if I'm not there, I don't feel I have any effect on the game. I feel I'm a an outsider. <laughs> so oh, you no, feel look, when you're in your stadium that you are uh, okay, fine. Oh yes, oh yeah. Oh, I mean, oh look, look the things I've gone through. I mean, last year, I mean, believe it or not, I was actually uh, I had a, a a lucky pair of boxer shorts which were in tangerine oh, and black, okay. which turned out to be not lucky at all. And this season, <laughs> what I did is, oh yeah, this season and. I, it was for the Wraith Rovers game. I put on a different jacket to go to the football and I turned my scarf the other way around so it was uh, black and tangerine spots as opposed to black and tangerine stripes. Lo and behold, won that 2-0. So that was, a, that was of course, the significant effect. Uh, you know. you, you, you're going to be losing us listeners and shed loads here. They're going, I thought this was a rational couple of people, you know. Oh, no, completely irrational. Completely irrational. But again, unless you actually support a, a team, in my case, a, a local team, and they actually do that, get that promotion yeah. and have that rush. It's it's incomprehensible to any, any normal well, person. Well, you see, I don't, I don't know, right? Because I was actually on whatever day it was, Saturday. <clears throat> um, I was I was speaking at the Hutters rally across mm. Dundee at the point when Celtic, you know, were playing. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> the Celtic Aberdeen match was on, and. Um, there were people sort of on the stalls, uh, actually just sitting glued to their phones, watching the whole thing. And I mean, I ended up you know, drifting over. And of course, as soon as it got to the very end and the, the penalty shootout and everything, you, you know, you, you, you're completely gripped by just the sheer drama of it. Mm-hmm. But OK, I'll, I'll, I'll discount that because that is just, you know, drama. Yeah. But what I was noticing on the way home, because I was listening to the commentary and stuff on the way home was how many of the commentators were basically saying they were just completely worn out, you know, because yeah. it was so that particular match, and I'm not not trying to <clears throat> diss any of your, the Dundee United match, but, I mean, you know, three all at the end of full time and all the ups and downs in that match, it, it, what it struck me was it's kind of like football lets men have emotions, or lets men talk about emotions, because they were actually, the whole discussion was incredibly emotional, you know, mm-hmm. there was an analysis of play and of players and, you know, who was doing well and whether the goalie should have been allowed to take a, <clears throat> you know, a penalty and all that kind of thing. Oh, but yeah. It was, but, you you know, listening to the engagement between the guys, it was it was a tremendously emotional sort of discussion. I, I don't know, you know, if there's a thing about that as an outlet somewhere. Obviously, there's an outlet for guys, you know, in that respect. But anyway, Jinx, I hear my, I'm not trying to get yeah, sucked Yeah, you're, you're wittering on football. about Celtic. <laughs> no, I don't care. football. 
No, no. You see, that's the difference. Yeah, well, suppose so. I mean, in in the sense that um, that's right. As a, yeah, I, I get that. But I mean, and it is it is genuine emotional like that. And I would say, you know, and maybe Tanner Dice is different, but I mean, there's a significant number of women and and young girls along there as well, particularly where I sit in the George Box Upper. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I got a tremendous number of likes and engagements with the video I put up, uh, which came after. Uh, uh, Ricky Ross and Deacon Blue's Dignity had been played just as the, the pitch invasion took place, which was the most peaceful invasion I've ever seen in my life. And I was actually standing there and I realised that the tears were forming in my eyes. It mm. really was that emotional. And, there, and when the goal went in, that, that surge of adrenaline, when the goal went in, particularly, it was scored by a young lad called Chris Mockery, who's a Dundee lad, who came up through the United Academy and is a Dundee United supporter and ran and leapt into the crowd the minute he scored. How oh, sweet. <laughs> and it's it's fantastic. I mean, and it is that thing of, and there were over 10,000 people there. And it, it's the, and I knew, and it, of course, at the back of my mind, I knew the, the business significance of getting back up into the Premiership. We've got games against Dundee, Aberdeen, Hearts, Hibs, Celtic Rangers. The money that's going to be bringing into the club and the potential for investment that's going to be coming from down south, uh, apparently from Brentford. I knew all that, but that was irrelevant at that time there. That was the logical part of my brain. But the emotional part of my brain from a, a team that I've been following and feel part of since I was 10 years old, was just utterly incredible after the the utter despair of last mm. year, and that yeah. goes for and, and that goes for whatever team you support, whatever team you support, it's like that, and that's the thing about being there and feeling part of it. And when you saw the players, I mean, after it was it was a hoot at the end because I mean, after about three minutes, this this very stentorian female voice came on, obviously something to do with police coordination, said, uh, Will you please get off the pitch? The celebrations must end. The players will not be coming back out for any celebrations. That's because the players were still there, jumping up and down, getting videos taken, leaping into the crowd again and t- having selfies. It was fantastic. Absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic. And the shots afterwards, that these are professional players. But when you saw the shots in the dressing room afterwards, it was it was laddies celebrating mm. and jumping and shouting and it was it was actually fantastic and it is that whole thing about about support and particularly and as i've said to you before being a dundee united supporter is kind of like being a supporter of the scottish independence it's the you look forward to the days when something good happens and you expect the worst constantly one of the one of the things that did uh, there the was a, a result i don't know if stephen gethens uh, who was the former MP for North East Fife, who's a, a big United supporter, uh, if he was there, but I think he probably was. But Stephen Flynn got a bit of flack uh, because he was at Tannerites rather than being on the, the big march in Glasgow. And it, it seems that he was not the only person who who didn't go to the big march in Glasgow, um, which kind of raises a question with me, Leslie, you know, I'm, uh, about the background to the march and uh, how unified it was and, and the amount of unity that could take place within that framework. And secondly, have these marches had their time? I mean, that's two genuine questions. Well, <clears throat> I wasn't there because I had been booked to speak at the Hunters mm-hmm. Rally in Dundee last year, before that this date was picked for a rally. And because I can't do two things in one day at the moment because of this blinking Lyme disease. <clears throat> so that was me kind of knocked out. Um, as far as the, the march is concerned, the, the, the way that those of us who set up the little group Time for Scotland had just a really, our view on how to try and do anything is that it had to be for a reason. There had to mm-hmm. be a date in it. There had to be something you were focused on and that marching on Saturdays for the crack is difficult because it probably won't get very much coverage um, and it, you do get a sort of quite why are we marching apart from where we're marching. Now, <clears throat> having said that, the event that Believe in Scotland organised in September did get about 25,000 people turning up on a Saturday for no reason mm-hmm. other than doing it. And <clears throat> it would have to be said, Hamza Yusuf having his first kind of speech, really, because he'd missed the All Under One Banner one in Glasgow by going to the coronation, which was, you know, a bit of a sore mm-hmm. point. Um so I don't know if people felt, even without all the problems that then materialised last week, 
with <clears throat> Peter Murrell and all the rest of it. Yeah. I don't know if people felt that there was enough of a reason for them to be basically out. And there is a thing, you know, it's, just, it's, you know, it's not a trade secret that all under one banner are the guys who yeah. think they have been organizing the street stuff for the last 10 years. They've been through different iterations. There's been difficulties with some of the personalities involved. Um, and and so, you know, the streets, you know, the streets don't belong to anybody or any group in particular. And believe in Scotland had decided they were going to do a march and, you know, they're perfectly allowed to have another one. Um, I, I just get to the stage where I'm sure a lot of people will feel the same is there are two marches now. There's that Believe in Scotland one and All Under One Banner have another one, I think, on May the 5th, uh, which are just kind of a couple of weeks apart. And I mean, this this is, you know, I, I understand how things arise. But looked at sort of objectively, this is kind of crazy. And there was all sorts of difficulty with, you know, the speakers from Alba, the speakers from the Greens not being on the same platform as one another. And, you know, actually now I think the thing, the only thing that would really impress people on on anybody's side, but particularly on those people supporting independence who are really taking a bit of a doof at the moment um you know given all the what's the backdrop of the snp is to see what is really difficult and it is i'm not suggesting this is easy but it is really difficult for people to get over themselves get over the clans that they have fallen into um and be able to find some way to just be on the same sort of platform with one another now i know that sounds like happy clappy pollyanna crap basically but if we can't do this then what the heck and I do, to your point, I do, you know, I mean, I, I do wonder about the utility, actually, of having, you know, marches for the crack, unless you've got everybody, all the groups coming together to basically pull, you know, every different kind of tradition or part of the movement together. Um, otherwise, it, it, it needs to be, from, from my mind, it needs to be the kind of thing where, you know, you, you, you act when there is some sort of thing that brings Scotland into the headlines and at that point, it's really important that any of the TV cameras that are inevitably coming see see a parliament surrounded by people who give a toss, you know. And in that respect, of course, my mind is very geared to how things, you know, the media side of things. But as discussed before, the the group Europe for Scotland, um, you know, you know, I'll never forget that when the guy from Italy basically said, "We don't see you guys doing anything." And that that really hit home because, by gum, you know, a lot of us have been doing stuff for 10 years solidly and yet not visible from outside Scotland. So every time there is a TV camera, I think it's kind of fairly easy to anticipate, but you have to be able to move quickly and be there the day, the very day that it happens. So that's what I would put my, personally speaking, put my energies into. But, you know, a thousand flowers blossom yeah because i mean i mean it's one of the things i felt about it when I mean, reading your article was i do get why people go on marches that sense of, of collectivism and community and boosting each other the difficulty behind it is if there aren't twenty five thousand people turn up that will be that will be representative look at the fall off the drop off and support for scottish independence and the question that you you raised in your, your article in the national was how do we display that we care if it isn't through vehicles like that, but it has to be properly organised and it has to be massive numbers on the street. Otherwise, it will be used to, to suggest. Oh, that they, see, I, they, I don't know that that's true. Uh, I mean, you know, very often it's it, if there is something that brings, you know, the cameras to outside the Scottish Parliament. And I mean, my, my, for every forgive me, everyone, my brain is not working as fast as it usually does. Um, but let's take, for example, the one that we highlighted, which which actually was not good for us. It was a Supreme Court verdict. You could anticipate that all the camera crews are going to be up. Um, we we got about 3000 people. So it wasn't 25000. But that's all that the shot could carry. You know, every every broadcaster was up. And what the message that they got was that, um, you know, independent supporters were uh, actually care about the outcome of this and we're pretty furious at discovering that indeed the you know this the, the Westminster Parliament is so sovereign that the Scottish Parliament the most powerfully devolved Parliament in the world doesn't have the capacity to hold a lawful referendum of its own people on the colour of paint for the front and um, so 
that that I think you don't need 25,000 or 100,000 for that. You need people uh, to be in the in the in the in view and active and bothering their backsides to get out when there's predictably going to be some issue here. But anyway, we're going on about this too much. I mean, that's that's my view on it. Yeah, because the the other thing about it was is that the fact, as you you've alluded to, was the fact of the uh, refusal of the Greens to actually appear on a platform with, platform with Alaba, and you said get over themselves. But if if it was a display of unity that was required to show, look, there is a there is there is unity across the political spectrum for an independent Scotland, it just highlighted the the difficulties I think that they are now being now coming to the fore. Uh, with the um, the vote that the Greens are going to be taking, where they continue with the, the Butte House Agreement, based on two issues: one, the rollback on the, the the climate change targets, which were targets that were actually set on a higher basis by the, the Scottish Parliament, not by the the government itself, and the reaction to to the Cast Review. So, and, and I know you were on Radio Scotland today and um, talking about that. So. I'll be intrigued to know how that went and y- your thoughts on it. Well, uh, I mean, the cast report is funny because the cast review, um, which was the one that said there's not enough evidence to support giving puberty blockers to people under the age of 18, which prompted the only clinic that does that in Scotland to decide that it wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be prescribing that. It seems the Scottish government, although um, have, have not got to the stage of saying, that's what we adopt, but are still discussing it. Um, and Patrick Harvey's been on, I mean, he was on the Sunday show and I would give him a lot of credit for actually pitching up because what's beginning to happen is that with all the difficulties there were about abandoning the green targets last week, uh, the, the relevant SNP ministers were just doing no shows right, left and centre, which is not OK. But anyway, Patrick Harvey turned up on the Sunday show um, and, you know, did, did a lot of his that, that green stuff, but was asked about four or five times by Martin Geisler whether he accepted um, the the review, the cast review. And he just didn't answer the question. Now, he was on the Today programme this morning. Exactly the same thing happened. And Twitter went bonkers. I mean, Patrick Harvey was trending <laughs> and yeah. you know, not not for reasons that he would be very happy with, because people were just furious that he wouldn't accept that this pretty, you know, high powered, genial yeah. looking woman who is now not able to travel on public transport because of the threats that have been issued against her. Um, actually did her job probably pretty thoroughly. And she's extreme. The thing that annoys her the most is actually when you read her stuff up is not even the threats against her and stuff like that. It's the misrepresentation of what happened in the review. Um, one um, Labour MP, uh, Don Butler, had suggested that over 100 studies had not been included uh, when in the in the in the cast re- review. And she kind of made the point that the researchers looked through, they needed to get a certain level of, you know, just efficacy in the in the data sets that they were prepared to admit into the review. And they decided that, that 60 out of 103 were good enough. So that's the 60 that they looked at. So there weren't hundreds in the first instance, plural, and that's the way they went about it. Now, I don't know, you know, everybody listening to this will have the backdrop view on gender issues by now. And I think people are using that to then go through a complex thing like this and decide what that then means, whether she's a good one or a bad one. And I just think that's I mean, it's so implausible that a woman like this would have spent the amount of time she did uh, to just basically produce a skewed report um, uh, so that I would give this, you know, I would absolutely give this woman the benefit of the doubt and the research process she went through. And I don't think it helps particularly to have now a standoff where you can't get an answer out of, you know, the leader, the leader, co-leader of the Scottish Greens, Patrick Harvey. He won't sort of almost engage with that. So we're just left with a standoff where Scottish Greens just don't like this, aren't going to answer and, you know, the rest of the world is having to look at a process that was went through that seems perfectly fair and wonder what the heck the problem with it is. Yeah, to be perfectly honest about it, I mean, I, I'm i always wary about this, but I did read the I did read the review and I read the summary. And I mean, and, and Hilary Cass 
she's a she's a retired consultant paediatrician and former president of the Royal College of Paediatricians and Child Health. And the conclusions that were reached, I mean, and the analysis that she did of the, the way that these services were being provided in, in England, and it was commissioned by NHS England and, uh, and NHS Improvement, d- did seem to me to be significant in the lack of evidence supporting the safe use of puberty blockers. There were, there were lots of other things in there aware about social transition, but the puberty blockers to me was a, was a significant one. And Again, there was the significant evidence contained within that about there is lack of knowledge about the long term impact of these puberty blockers because they're originally prescribed for um, precocious puberty, which is in, in, in young women, girls who reach puberty far too early and it stops it happening. And uh, the, the, all sorts of evidence to do with the potential cognitive damage and things like that. And I mean, and it, it, it again, it just did seem very convincing to me that something that should be treated seriously and if there were criticisms going to be made of it, if you're done on a, a proper scientific basis and not on that. But again, what, that's what we talked about before. You're either on team A or team B on this. And just on, on, on reflection on it, and the Greens are going back to reconsider the Butte House Agreement. And also that Joanna Cherries has been suggesting that the, the SNP membership should have a, a vote on it as well. I just wonder, would, uh, I don't know what Hamza Youssef has said about he believes it's important to keep the Greens in, go- in, in government with them and uh, to continue the agreement. I just wonder if there'd be a sigh of relief if the Greens actually voted to, to exit the Butte House Agreement amongst SNP uh, voters and supporters of Scottish independence in general. Well, you know, I'm sure there would be. I'm sure there would be. But I mean, a, a, a large part of me actually gets quite annoyed about all of this because... Here's the real world, right? There was an election. There was a choice of candidates. There was not a majority, working majority for the SNP. Um, The SNP and the Greens, right, um, you know, there's been a lot of things said about their prioritisation of independence, but there's a lot of people, Mm -hmm. you know, with their doubts about the SNP as well. So whatever. In the real world, we have a proportional parliament that would tend to produce coalitions. If these two sets of people cannot work together, you you kind of begin to despair. The climate crisis hasn't gone away. The need to actually learn from having not got to the targets means that the people who are kind of in situ, you could argue, uh, mind you, some of the mistakes about targeting belong to an era with politicians who are now not on the frame anymore. But I mean, we've got to not get, I mean, there's an excellent, excellent piece written by Robin McAlpine on this, where he's saying, you know, for goodness sake, just stop now. I mean, what's happening is that the SNP raced out a whole load of, look, we're really at it. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And what he's pointing out is that the kind of um, ideas for how to reach, you know, how to make this transition have been essentially so poor Uh a lot of them have been, if they've been good ideas, they've been handed essentially to the private sector to enable. Uh, they're not cutting to the heart of a lot of the problems. Don't start me on district heating, but there we are again. And instead of just trying to double down on, a, if you like, a basket of measures that has failed to to engage and and and, and to to you know get us anywhere near the targets, he's really saying let's stop and really have a think about what will get us to dry land. Because what's happening at the moment is there is footering. Uh, there's what feels to people like annoying kind of micromanagement. There are what feels like the smallest things first. You know, if you're going to make big changes, you put the big rocks in first. You put the little ones around it. And what we've been seeing with this a lot of the time is that we end, you know, start off with a bottle return scheme or we start off with trying to stop wood burning stoves or something. With all due respect to the impact they can make, they are not the big blinking rocks. The big rocks are heating homes and commercial premises and switching to district heating and sorting out our transport system and, yes, our agriculture. So where's that? You know, and that's the difficult. They might the Greens might well say, I'll tell you where it is. We managed to get, you know, free bus travel for under. 22s or whatever and uh, there's the oldies we've all got our bus passes as well <laughs> but uh, but the problem still remains with the bus travel for example which I both of us use a lot I use a lot um, if you don't end up with good you know 
you can you can make your outgoing journey quite happily by bus. And then you begin to look at your return trips a bit later on. And unless you're just coming back, you know, operating in a nine to five basis, you often find that you just get stuck, particularly where we are in North Fife. You just get stuck if you're trying to get back to Dundee. So it's as kind of a misses as good as a mile with all of these things. It's like, you know, the, I see Alba is infuriated that money is being spent on cycle paths. I get infuriated when I see money being spent on cycle paths that doesn't make a complete system enough for people to feel safe enough to use the damn things. It's it's the same thing again. I mean, someone I spoke to today said that there's just ever so much virtue signaling going on in a lot of the green measures that have been pushed forward and that they haven't been well enough formulated as policy. And that that would be my worry. So I'm with Robin is is calling for a pause, then a really proper national conversation about what measures we want to take. I mean, this would be a bit like you deciding someone deciding they wanted to lose a stone in weight, but they just generally think I'll eat a bit less all the time. <laughs> you know, you, you might spot what your tendencies are. Personally speaking, I'm fine until about seven o'clock at night and then I just get the nibbles. So I know perfectly well what it is I have yeah. to do, you know, to target the thing. We need to have a conversation about getting the big changes in first and how to do them without penalising individual households, how to collectivise the shifts that we have to make. And I see Robin has called for a kind of climate fair to be organised. And indeed, it was Robin and Commonweal that organised the ideas space across the Squinty Bridge in the Clyde from the SNP conference probably about seven or eight, perhaps longer years ago, on the basis that no ideas were actually being discussed in that very corporate event. um, And that ideas had to be, you know, they had to be somewhere. So uh, if he's, you know, I'd be absolutely delighted to kind of get involved and support something like that. This climate fair would have all the renewable kit, all that you can touch it. You can, you know, you can use the machinery. You can see what the differences would be. But this doesn't get us round. And, you know, Commonweal have basically put the challenge out there again and said, look, we've produced oodles amount of work through stuff. Go and speak to us. Yeah. You know, Um it would be nice to think that, that <clears throat> that's possible. There's obviously been a bit of kind of, you know, nippiness kind of working in, in perhaps in both directions. And, you know, having a pressure group kind of say, I told you so, probably gets people's backs up a bit at this point. But they did tell them so, you know what I mean? So we just need far better policy. Well, well talking about that, talking about ideas, I don't know if you noticed that, uh, on St Andrew's Day, the Independence Forum Scotland, the IFS, are, I've suggested, uh, are going to hold an independence convention talking about sovereignty, the constitution, industrial strategy, land reform, Ray, health and well-being. And uh, the first stage is to set up an advisory committee, which is going to be in place by the end of April, uh, and they're going to be inviting leading members of the independence movement to to form part of this advisory committee and I mean and I had a look at the independence forum Scotland again there's so many of these these groups working away but they do seem to be interesting in terms of the uh, the the committee and more interesting in terms of the the groups that are involved with them uh, and associated with them which seems to cover a wide spectrum of uh, yes groups the SNP trade union group etc uh, within that framework so but again it's 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 one of these things that yeah, it sounds a great idea, and but it, like a lot of these things, it just feels a bit top down to me. And I mean, if that's just a gut reaction, I may be entirely incorrect, but it's a top down. But suppose if ideas are going to have to come from somewhere, then it's going to be ideas based. That the top, the top may be a place to start these ideas, and then get the narrative out elsewhere. But I'll be intrigued to see uh, what the makeup of that advisory committee is going to be, and that will give me some some insight into what the the convention will be like in November. Sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I've seen that coming in and I just didn't have enough time to look at it properly. I'm I'm not sure what the top in it that you're worried about is, what, that there's an advisory committee? Yeah. Because seriously, you don't get much organised in life unless you've got a small Mm -hmm. group of people doing it. So that, that wouldn't worry me so much. Um, And this behind the scenes, there are a lot of people, uh, 
beginning to feel that they can't depend on the SNP for a lot. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's obviously there's been, you know, there was a, in fact, I went and bought the Herald on Sunday um, because it had a front page uh, headline that it's not if Hamza Youssef goes, it's when, according to a senior, you know, insider in the SNP, who you do wonder actually, but, you know, whoever they are, I guess that is definitely talking up the alternative candidates. And again, you know, colour me completely wrong here, but there, and clearly leadership does matter. I mean, it does, obviously it does, but I just get the feeling this is, you know, would any, would any change of leader, for example, get us sorted about just let, let's just take that the biggest issue that we've got, which is having missed the green goals. Um, it, you know, is there anybody in the back? Is it is it a kind of technical problem that somebody else like Kate Forbes or Stephen Flynn or somebody else, if they came in, would sort of go, you silly billies, look here, this is what we should have done. I don't know that there's enough expertise actually in the Scottish Parliament because of the amount of bills that have been passed that seem to be slightly flawed and don't. That's one issue, but don't get to the heart of what has to happen. So, for example, back on to me. Right, I will. This is this is like you've had a wee bit of a shot with Dundee <laughs> United. So I'm now doing my one minute on district heating thing. But I, w- I spoke to to uh, a pal about this who knows quite a lot about it. Seems the pr- one of the big problems with <clears throat> with district heating is the price of electricity, and uh, currently the price of electricity is high because it's pegged to the price of gas. Now this does seem crazy, and it's actually the way it works pretty much across Europe, funnily enough. But gas sets the price of electricity, and this this will fry your brain, because the price in every half hour period is set by the marginal cost of the last generating unit to be turned off. Now, the last unit to be turned off is never generally renewables because they're cheaper than all the rest. So they're the ones that stay on. The one that gets turned off is, generally speaking, gas. This is just bonkers, right? (laughs) Um, Which is invariably a gas power plant with high marginal costs. Yeah. So here we are locked into this. And when I, I actually sort of thought, but this is so utterly bonkers. Why, you know, even in a bonkers world we're in, why are we all putting up with this? And then even more astonishing, and I'm, I'm glad you were sitting down, Pat, is that uh, no less than quasi quarting promised change. <laughs> like, oh, the useless, yeah. useless chancellor, yeah. who nonetheless, back in October 2022, uh, was saying that this was not good enough and he was going to be the guy that was going to go in and figure this out. There's a move to try to split the wholesale market into two so that the pricing for renewables would be separate from the pricing for fossil fuels. Um, there's a another system called locational pricing, but same, but a bit different. And uh, the experts suggest that this approach would produce savings across all regions proportionately greater in Scotland. Right. So we we want this. We need this because at the moment you can't get going on things like district heating because the electricity price is just too bit too high for anybody to want to make that switch. And, you know, at the moment, as I'm told, uh, the actual price, let's say, of of, uh, of of a wind turbine is something like seven pence for a kilowatt hour. That's really low. But the price that you'll end up paying is 30 pence for a kilowatt hour because it jumps up because of this equation with the gas price. And in the meantime, it would have to be said, and I am lumbering through this as a kind of amateur that spent 10 minutes on it or longer, but still, um, it means that some of the renewable companies are actually making a few bob. Now, it might not. It's not a few bob like uh, BP and Shell, right? (laughs) But mm-hmm. because they're getting paid more than they actually, you know, more than the seven pence it costs to get that kilowatt, you know, that that wind out, there's there's probably a bit of an inbuilt resistance by them to getting this system changed. But we've got to get it changed. And who's in control of that? Westminster. Yeah. So one suggestion was to sort of take one big, uh, take any big uh, wind system, wind farm in Scotland and basically use that energy in a private system to create district uh, heating sort of solutions all the way along 
the the kind of network. Let's say, for example, just the sake of argument, something like um, I'm trying to remember it's called White Hills, the White Lees, the big the, one of the big ones above East Kilbride. That could be brought into Glasgow, bringing just that electricity in to a private system that could set up district heating all along the line, because that gets you out of this bind. But that takes the Scottish government doing something a bit frisky. Probably the private money would be there to deliver it, but they would have to say they would underwrite it. That's what you know. one person at the centre of this suggested as a possible way to get through. Now, you're probably all sitting thinking, talk about football again. Come on, why don't you? You know, right. But the thing is, this is there is nothing else except this that will crack the heating thing. You know, this is the level of somebody having to figure this stuff out. All the rest of it is flannel. Because until we figured this out, nobody will switch to any kind of district heating or or heat pumps, actually. You can get the money to install it, but you're still sitting with massive costs for the electricity. So this is what I expect to hear from somebody. Now, I don't sit in Holyrood listening to every committee or any committees in a general sense. So this could all perhaps have been discussed. But the thing is, the folk who are got, you know, who are experts in this are basically tearing their hair out and just not seeing it happen at all. Gosh, I mean, yes, I mean, it's insane. I mean, politically and morally nuts. The, 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 is, the, the, if, if the, you know, one big difficulty is this business of the gas price dictating everything else, then why the heck is a Scottish government that's committed to independence not locating the problem where it originates, as in that's a thing they are not able to change, and just saying, so we're going to try some workarounds because we're going to get this fixed now. I, I just don't understand that. And it could be that I haven't got enough, although my brain's got fried even getting this far, I'm sure there's far more complexity in it. But, you know, it, it, and it needs to come out from behind uh, all the curtains uh, and we need to have a wholehearted, here's what we can do as a country, kind of joint project on this. Yep. Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I was, yeah, it is. I mean, any time I hear about the, the, the tying of the electricity and all other prices to the to, to the price of gas, I'm aghast at it. I, but it is that whole thing that it, it goes on in the background and it needs to be foregrounded. And as you rightly say, it needs to be foregrounded as a narrative and then action of the workarounds. But as you say, it's got to be something something the Scottish government is, is prepared to do. And it's big stones, Leslie, as you said, it's mm. big stones to do that. It's not the little things. It's big stones. And that's the sort of practicality that even when operating within the, the, the devolution settlement that, that I always complain about, the fact you're in government, you're going to be shot at because you're in government and you're always going to have to come up with the, 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 the rationale is that we can't do this because Westminster controls that. And it comes back to that central argument we continually make is, and you in particular, that this is what the Scottish government can do. And it's asking the question as to why you're not doing it. And well, if you're not doing it for a good reason, tell us. Yeah. And, you, you know, there's there's actually Commonweal have produced some really excellent stuff on this. We'll put the links in the podcast because, you know, they're, they're looking at possible solutions. I can't remember if it was Robin or, or Craig DL um, who was also talking about um, getting the councils to work together because ironically they're able to borrow more um, than than the Scottish government, but that would also have the virtue of creating a national system based on municip- muni- yeah. essentially municipalities working together. So all these things are well worth doing, uh, and we just we have to get that level of connectedness so that we've not got woolly targets. I mean, this is what drives me mad listening to all of this is, okay, everybody's saying, yeah, you know, it was no use just having the targets and, you know, I want to sort of lose about 1% of my body mass, but I'm not going any further on that. And basically the biscuit tin isn't an issue and, you know, the time of night, no, nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, so yeah, well, I mean, all that, <laughs> all that kind of stuff about targets, of course that was no use. But listen to the criticism of it even. It's no more detailed. You know, there's, this is a completely blooming detail-free zone. 
you know, people are shuffling on, including the freaking Tories. I mean, just hold me back. Um, talking about, you know, the the appalling embarrassment. I mean, the same C- Climate Change Committee has said, you know, that there's an almost certain chance that they're going to basically say the same about the UK's yeah. climate targets this year, which is that they can't be realised either, you know. Um, so it, it's like everybody and a lot of the EU is in some of the same difficulty. Um, but the point is, those people criticising it are also coming in and just going, oh, what's the point in having targets if you haven't, haven't got detail? OK, pal, give us a detail then. Huh? Yeah. No, no hearing you. Speak up. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if these if folk haven't got the expertise, go and find people who know what they're talking about. They're in the industry. They, for example... Um, I I I, uh, I tune, tune in isn't the right word, but I get an a email thingy from Scottish Housing News uh, organised by the estimable Jimmy Black uh, of Dundee, indeed, who also used to be a producer on my programmes way back in the day in Radio Scotland. And, you, you know, there's a, there's a letter in there from all different sides of, of industry. And this is not the big boys. This is all the small groupings that are doing the you know, the ground source heat pumps and the renewable heating, Scottish Renewables, Dave Pearson from Star Renewables, all these guys are saying, for God's sake, bring on uh, having a, a heat in buildings bill, which apparently has kind of stalled in Holyrood. So thing is, where are the politicians talking about this? Because if I don't hear somebody talk about something specific like this soon, I'm just going to switch off every time we we start talking about this. Yeah. Gosh, well, well, leaping in on that and and switching over because you did mention the Tories and uh, uh, Rishi Sunak's statements on the Rwanda bill, which is currently undergoing what is referred to as ping pong between the the House of Commons and the House of Lords, which Sunak claims is dominated, dominated by uh, the recalcitrant Labour peers, totally forgetting the actual uh, overwhelming numbers of Conservative peers that are actually in, in the House of Lords and crossbenchers who seem to be opposed to the Rwanda bill on the basis that it's, yeah, it's uh, it's it's against the, all human rights legislation. Rwanda isn't a safe country, but they're going to be spending, I think, half a billion quid on a system which has signally failed even the threat of it to stop the small boats crossing. And uh, they're, they're going to be sitting up all night and trying to get this through in the next couple of days because those flights are going to take off to Rwanda in July. It's, it, to me, it seems an absolute crazy situation that they got themselves into the Conservatives where, A, they believe this is a vote winner, B, they believe that people are actually can, uh, are actually going to be supportive of the Rwanda bill and to actually believe that this might actually generate support for them in the forthcoming general election. It's it just seems a bam pot one to, to, to go ahead with, to use a, a Dundee phrase. Well, I'd, I'd imagine not that, you know, I mean, absolutely, this just does seem like you're looking at a crazy world when you look at the priorities yeah. of that entire parliament. It's just like looking at somewhere else. But I mean, May the 2nd, local elections uh, in in England, although if you're listening to almost any of the uh, broadcasters, they are national elections. Of course, they are indeed to the nation of England, but we'll come back to this confusion between the nation of England and the whole blooming shooting match in a minute. Um, But still, uh, there's got to be something that by May the 2nd, you know, the, the Tories are looking at a complete wipeout that could lose some of their metro mayors, which, you know, seems to be unthinkable. So the only thing since he started, he has to finish. This was the one that he's kind of put most of his energies in. So I, I think for them, it's almost not a question now of even the content of the policy. It's simply that they said they would get this done and it has to be. It's one of the five. You know, so inflation has just done what it it was going to do on its own. Um, I can't remember what the others are. There's a couple that they've completely failed on. So it looks like he's just got wants to be able to stand there and say, despite all the attempts by foreign courts and, you know, unpatriotic people in the Labour Party and blah, 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 we have got these planes off the ground. Well, they won't by May the 2nd, but we have got the legislation through. We've battled it through. 
So yeah. it's just to be able to say, you know, almost with the late Magnus Magnuson in mind, you know, we blooming started, so we finished. <laughs> and yet, if you look at, you know, the details of what the actual, you know, the lords have whittled it down to, the two things that they're really hanging out for now, one is uh, a Labour peer, Des Brown. He's pushing for an amendment to exempt Afghans who served alongside the UK military from being deported to Rwanda. Mm. And I mean, just if anybody just wants to rewind their brains to the shocking nature of what we all watched happening, um, you know, when the Taliban took over again and <clears throat> desperate people were trying to get out of the country and couldn't. But those who did hanging off the edge of aircraft, some of them killed just a horrible, horrible situation. And what we've now got a situation that the people who, who did that were translators and did all those jobs and everything endangering their lives. They're just going to be put straight onto planes to Rwanda. That's the size of this. Yeah. So that's the one. That's one amendment. And that's what the Tories are just going to push back on. So, you know, I don't know what that says to anyone around the world. But then they if they watched carefully, they would probably have guessed it already. The British government doesn't give a toss about you anywhere. Just our guys kind of, you know, on a good day and the rest of you can just go swivel. So there's number one. Number two is a crossbench peer, David Anderson, who by all accounts is the most incredibly meek, almost sort of, you know, uh, technocratic guy, although perhaps I should have delved further before giving him that accolade. But nonetheless, he's a former independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. I didn't realise that was a kind of job. But anyway, his his thing is trying to secure that a monitoring committee decides if Rwanda can be considered safe. And, you know, the, the utterly astonishing thing about this one is if this law gets passed as it is, Rwanda will be considered safe forever. Yeah. It, there's no end date on this. So if there was another civil war in Rwanda, it's still considered safe, no matter what happens from here on in. So all this guy is trying to do is to just kind of reality proof stuff by having a monitoring committee, which is utterly standard, according to him, for all the kind of frameworks of things he spent his life being involved with. Uh, and so that's the other one that the, the, the Tories are just going to go talk to the blooming handmaid, because we're now at a stage where, just to say that we've been able to do one of Rishi is Rishi's fifth five kind of commitments, we have to before May the second, which is kind of one week or something, we have to say we have got this through the Commons. We have got this. Through, sorry, we've got this through Westminster, the whole shooting match, both houses. And if we stop to take on board these these utterly significant uh, points, it will slow the whole thing up. And we won't be able to say it's done. And that's what we've got here for Westminster governance. Yeah, and I listened to that Cooper, the Shadow uh, Home Secretary. No, they said Labour will stop the flights. But again, she was shilly shy around the edges as well. Because what she focused on entirely was A, waste of money. It wasn't going to work. And then B, that that money should be shifted to to tackling security and securing our borders issues and talking about police cooperation across Europe and a more efficient system of actually tackling the criminal gangs who are actually exploiting these de desperate people. Not one word was said about opening up uh, safe legal routes. Not one word was said about tackling the root causes of mass migration, of the wars that these people are escaping and the economic deprivation caused by climate change that is, is mm. kicking in that people are trying to escape from. And again, it was that whole focus of the, the, the Labour Party at this point in pivoting to conservative dominated issues and issues that conservatives perceive to be strong on, such as borders and security, etc., and patriotism, which we'll be talking about. Also noted as well that three UN special rapporteurs dealing with uh, human trafficking and migrant rights have said that if the airlines, as the current conditions exist, if the airlines take on board these flights, they may be complicit in violating human rights and court orders. So mm -hmm. warning is going out for the UN rapporteurs. And, and it just as that that whole let's oh, forget about forget about uh, international law, right? foreign courts and judges and softies are here, there and legal rights or law. It's not. No, this is, uh, you know, 
And that's what they're going for. As I say, I was very, very, I'm eternally disappointed in current Labour Party about, about the position on that. And uh, the, the, the thing I was thinking about, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I've been mean, listening to Liz Truss. She was talking about Chino's Conservatives in name only, which she nicked from Rhino's, the Republicans in name only. And I was thinking about Lino, Labour in name only. Because, I mean, I lived in Lockheed <laughs> and up on, up on South Road, there was a there was a linoleum factory and you could <laughs> smell the reek of the linoleum that was being constructed. <laughs> so that's what that's what they're going to be lying though. So you can smell the reek of the current version of the Labour Party of rollback. I mean, on every every recognisable measure that, 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 that they possibly could be uh, define themselves as a, as a centre left political party. And our friend Sir Keir Starmer, in one sentence. Uh, which I read uh, part of his Daily Telegraph article, talked about English patriotism and then went on to say that was uh, the essential nature of being British. And, and the utter conflation between the two. And uh, it's, it is, it's, it's wrapping himself in the flag. And I just wonder, does he care about uh, Northern Ireland? Does he care about the Labour vote in Wales? Does he really care about the Labour vote in Scotland? And what's the reaction in Wales and Scotland in particular from uh, the leadership of the, the Welsh Labour Party and the Scottish Labour Party to this wrapping in the flag, which does actually reveal the fact that no matter what we Wales votes, no matter what we Scotland votes, forget Northern Ireland folks, because we don't want to talk about them, but no matter which way we vote, we will get the government that England votes for, and Starmer is targeting that specifically. Yeah, I, I just think he's, <laughs> I just think he, he he just gets tired and he basically, his brain just does that thing that English, British, the conflation, um, you know, because I don't, yeah, don't know if it's even deliberate anymore. It's just once you get, you know, you get into the thick of it so much, you can't keep your brain in a place that it doesn't naturally want to find. And I don't think any of them, no no leader, including uh, Jeremy Corbyn, has come to Scotland and not put their foot right up their, yeah. you know, bookie. So that it's kind of like, it's like having to kind of memorise, don't mention this, do mention that, don't say this, don't say that. Because left to their own devices, England is Britain, Britain is England, the nation is the entire United Kingdom. And that's the way it is. They all slip back into it. I mean, I just picked up Channel 4 News, who yeah. have put a tweet out yeah. with a sort of, hey, look at the lineup. We've already got booked for the general election night, whenever it is. And, it, you know, it does look pretty good, actually. There's Emily Maitlis and there's um, Rory the Tory and Alistair Campbell and obviously Christian Gurumurthy. But there's nobody from not England. You know, there's, <laughs> just while we're at it, you know, the SNP currently is the third largest party in British politics. There is Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Hello, everybody. And nobody even looked at that and thought, mm, I don't know. Will that look a bit annoying to anybody that's not from essentially, you know, England? No, I, I, I don't know if anybody will. I haven't, you know, I'm sort of giving myself a bit of a time off here for the moment uh, by not looking at all the comments that come in because, you know, it takes years yeah. off your life. eh? But yeah. uh, I don't know if anybody will actually take the point because it always sounds so blooming nippy, you know, on our part. But the bit, I mean, this, this is a quote from Starmer today. It's probably, you know, d d extracted from that um, article where he says, you know, basically Labour is champion championing the British hope that if you work hard, anyone can do well in life. That's British. This is why I have no time for those who flinch at displaying our flag, because the cross of St. George belongs to every person who loves this country. Yeah. This is just, you know, this brings me back to my nine year old self sitting in a school in Belfast, cheerfully correcting every time that British and English got mixed up, basically thinking I was doing everyone a service and then getting <laughs> kind of like out my ear for you know <laughs> defacing books and stuff. Because it's just these are like chi childlike mistakes. You know, to talk about a British hope, um, hope then talk mm -hmm. about, you know, no time for people flinching at displaying our flag. Well, OK, our British, the cross of St. George. Look, you're, you know, for English folk, knock yourselves out with your cross of St. George. I can remember working down there probably 15, 20 years ago or something when 
the cross of the St George flag started to be used for football. And I was actually quite pleased about that because at long last it was like, fine, you've got that. You know, the, you, the Union Jack's not appropriate for the English team, right? You get the St George flag and that's fine. And, you know, but but here we are again now with this just complete conflation of everything, like nothing really matters at all. So anyway, we've noted it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm sure everybody in Scotland will be celebrating the English holiday of St. George tomorrow on Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> Probably well, not. But, you know, because yeah. we don't really celebrate our own ones much. But, you know, all part of your elbows. Just just go for it. Yeah, well, because I look back at the 1966 World Cup when World Cup Willie was bedecked in the Union flag. And it was the Union flag that was all over at Wembley when England won the World Cup. And even as a 14-year-old, I thought, well, wait a minute, hang on there, pal. And I wasn't that politically aware. Maybe I was, I suppose I was picking up on that. But I remember, just as an, an anecdote, when I went to the National Council of Training in Journalism and anything that, that came up, they said, oh, we're always delighted you're here, Pat, because you remind us about devolution. I'm thinking, hang on a minute here. You know, this is the National Council for Training in Journalism. You shouldn't have to have someone from Scotland who reminds you that Northern Ireland and Wales and Scotland are different in all these sorts of matters, in particular uh, when it comes to uh, public affairs and and the legal systems. So that 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 was that one there. Um, But um, But, you know, I was just going to go back to because we didn't. I mean, in a way, there's a pretty huge thing happening with the SNP here because you, you talked about Joanna Cherry and, in fact, Alex Neil. I think, I don't know, mm-hmm. there's, you know, other people have come out saying that the SNP should have a vote on whether yeah. or not they want to carry on with the <clears throat> the Butte House Agreement. And, I mean, the thing is, you know, as you asked the question, obviously everybody, you know, we've now got to a stage where everybody's learning to dislike the Greens as the kind of petty little neurotic guys that are getting in the way of you know and this is just not true i mean okay there there's a lot of shortcomings within the, the if you like the the green performance but you know there's 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 not there's not like been a huge array of tremendous ideas sitting on the shelves which the greens have gone along and sabotaged when it comes to what inevitably is going to happen which is having to change our lives in this respect so, I mean, of course, there's going to be a scapegoating thing here happening. Absolutely. And it's probably totally true as well that actually the SNP will stand a better chance in an election if they have scapegoated the the Greens and sort of, you know, bounce them out of it. And we can just do this ourselves, which like knock yourselves out. It takes a lot more energy to to do a minority government. I suppose one could say that if there wasn't that convenient pact, you might actually have to be putting through your paces a lot more as policymakers because you would actually have to go around and persuade people to back you. The problem being that, you know, that takes a lot of energy and time and you can, in an election year, you you are probably unlikely to get a lot of support from parties who will absolutely be having to put clear whatever colour you want water between the SNP and themselves. So it ain't going to be no walk in the park to be trying to run Holyrood on a minority basis. And yet it probably it, it might well be very popular. I would have loved to see, however, um, the SNP having some kind of, if you like, square square go some moment with their own membership, um, which which hasn't happened. I mean, they had a, a, a blink and you miss it something or other, I can't even remember what it was called, in Perth a couple of weekends ago in lieu of what used to be a spring conference. Um, and so this, the chance for the for the membership of the SNP to say the things they want to say, and, I mean, knocking around the place, I've heard all sorts of, I've met people who've simply just left the SNP, actually after the Peter Merrill thing, but not so much even because of that, but because of annoyance over internal problems like god vetting candidates this still is such a a vexed point that that process seems to take forever and is also a lot of people are very miffed about the kind of candidates chosen now you might say there'll always be sour grapes but by gum that's a lot i mean as i trot around the place doing the film there seems to be a lot of discontent about that and I'm, it's not just a question for Hamza about his leadership. Murray Foote is the chief executive now, and the mission was to try to 
basically be a different kind of party, you know, so it wasn't just ducking and trying to kind of make sure it didn't have to kind of have that moment where it had an open, straightforward, big conversation with its own membership. Um, And yet that seems to be what it's turning into, which is not good enough. So uh, I don't know quite what Joanna and co are thinking in terms of, you know, having an event to discuss that, but it could end up being a really powerful focal moment for for a bit of tr- a bit of a truth session yeah. on a lot of fronts, which is well well overdue. So I'm not saying let's not you know let's just tidy it all under the carpet, but I hope in the process people would have to say if you want to get back to the stuff that matters, who has got the good ideas, and because if you haven't got a shelf full of good ideas about how to make our our country better, um. A lot of people will just conclude the whole SNP is over. Yeah. So let's have that. And my 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 take on it is is that uh, the SNP is the only political game in town. We can have a, a a long discussion about the 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 road to independence, but as it currently stands, the political party, the political road to independence, will always be through the will currently and always be through the SNP as it stands, and that any anyone that decides not to vote and then the forthcoming general election for SNP. I just want them to stop and think, if you believe in Scottish independence, how will you feel the way it is represented in the narrative in the media if the SNP lose seat after seat after seat after seat? And that means uh, to uh, independence, no matter how fraught it may be, is taken away from us. And the assumption is there is no support for Scottish independence because the SNP have lost these seats, despite our knowledge that 40 odd to 50 percent of the Scottish uh, voting public believe in Scottish independence. And that's the, the gut reaction that I have. I know that if I watch SNP seats falling, I will be gutted. I will not be happy about it at all because I know the way that will be used. Uh, and and but anyway, but yeah, moving on, I'm going to move on. And that, that sigh was, was a bit too hard felt. And just as the, I, I went to the pictures this week, I did do something other than going to football. And I'm I'm going to recommend a movie to everyone. And I think you'll be particularly interested in it. It's called Civil War. And if people have seen the trailers for it, they will think it's some kind of Marvel shoot 'em up It is anything but. It is an incredibly intense, brilliantly directed film by Alex Garland. Uh, the cast is superb. The only person you will have heard of is Kirsten Dunst, uh, about a group of journalists who set out in a slightly in the future United States of America, which is engaged in civil war because there's a fascist uh, president who's uh, decided he's, he's going to have a third term. And Texas and California have seceded from the Union and there's a civil war going on. And they set out on this odyssey as photojournalists to reach uh, Washington and the White House in an attempt to get the last interview with the dictator before the White House falls. And it is incredibly intense. And it is a a meditation on the role of the photojournalist, the role of the journalist in general as an observer or a participant. And it is also so pertinent to what we see going on in conflict areas like Gaza. it And the final sequence, I, I've rarely been so tense in a final sequence um, as, as, they, as they reach Washington and what goes on. So I, I, I thoroughly recommend to everyone, do not be put off by the fact that it's been trailed as a some kind of merry shoot 'em up it is, it is an outstanding film, brilliantly acted, brilliantly directed, uh, brilliantly short, so thoroughly recommend Civil War. And actually, one of our listeners has, has been in touch to talk about something he's doing. It's Jamie Johnsey, who is in fact, well, his great great uncle uh, was Don Roberto, otherwise uh, known as uh, well, the, the the man who basically helped found the Scottish Labour Party. Then was the founding president of the Scottish National Party. Um, he was Robert Cunningham Graham. And uh, Jamie has written a book about that, Don Roberto. It's a great book. 
He's also got a weekend focus on all of this. Uh, he had an incredible life, actually. Just have a quick Google. We'll put the link up. Uh, the weekend is May the 11th to the 12th. There's talks in Sterling's uh, Smith Gallery, and then there's a visit to where he lived. So if anybody's interested in that, I mean, a really tremendous energy of a guy, um, that'll be a great outing on May the 11th and 12th. And we will provide the details. Yeah, oh, yeah, and the little I know about Don Roberto, an absolutely amazing life story. And uh, that's it for this week, folks. As I say, you may have uh, identified as I, we've gone through this, uh, even though when I got angry, at the back of my mind, there's, there's still that chant of, we are going up, pump it up. Dundee United are going up. On on that, totally self-centred, football-related... <laughs> too, <piece> right. Of, <laughs> too right. Too <laughs> right. We'll, we'll see you next week, Jobs. <laughs>